Good evening. My name is Larry Beckwith. Welcome to those of you here in Walter Hall and the many friends and family joining us via live stream to this celebration of the long and remarkable life of John Beckwith. Composer, teacher, writer, historian, former dean of this great institution, son, brother, partner, father, father-in-law, uncle, grandfather, great-grandfather, friend. One of his last major works was Wendaki Hieronia, commissioned in 2015 by the Brookside Music Association and written with the collaboration of the Wendat poet Georges Sui. On the occasion of the Toronto premiere, my father was presented with the gift of a bolo tie made specially for him by drummers Marilyn George and Shirley Hay. I have it with me tonight, and in the spirit of that beautiful reconciliatory project, hold it to my heart as we acknowledge that tonight's memorial takes place on the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we recognize the need to engage in meaningful work to redress past wrongs and move forward together in a good way. I know not my own form. I have a beginning, but know not my end. Those fragile words of David Wilson's that John Beckwith set with such beauty and poignancy at the beginning of Sharon Fragments speak to the mystery of life. My father spent his life concerned with the things that he could know, uncover and impart, and he found endless interest and fascination in the thoughtful, creative work of humans. As we celebrate and remember this evening all the different areas in which John Beckwith led the way as a champion of Canadian music, of music in general, we are reminded that he was a lifelong learner, that he gained much knowledge and wisdom from his teachers, his colleagues, his collaborators, his students, his friends, and of course his reading and travel. He engaged in the solitary pursuits of composing and writing, and yet was a tremendously social person who loved a party and lived for going to concerts and plays. He was selfless and generous in lending his time and energy to boards of directors, advisory boards and committees. He was productive and always had many important projects on the go, each of which he engaged in with singularity of purpose and concentrated attention to detail. Life threw him some major curves, yet he always managed to forge ahead with resilience, logic, and inspiring strength. And he was blessed in the second half of his life to have his soulmate, Kathleen, walking, dancing, cycling alongside him. Tonight's program has been put together with a view to considering the many musical and literary worlds that fed my father's creative spirit. Abstract instrumental patterns and sounds, a wide variety of writers whom he admired, perhaps most importantly and enduringly, his close friend and collaborator, James Rainey. His fascination with hymnody, especially as it was created and practiced in North America his attraction to the home and stories of the Children of Peace at the Sharon Temple in East Willenbury, just north of Toronto, his close working relationships with Robert Aitken, P Peter Stoll, Monica Witcher, David Fallis, Lawrence Turney, Terry Dunn, and those who showed an interest in studying and promoting his music, especially Bradley Christensen and Katie Clark, who have dedicated their written doctoral studies to aspects of his work. Enjoy the music. And I hope we can all carry forward from this evening, each in our own way, the inspiration of John Beckwith's richly creative work and happy memories of his passion and zest for life.
purple tint. Please tell me why this summer world and you and I, who love so much to live, must die, must die. I could tell you anything that eager, sweet, caroling self answers me. I could not see, not see, could not see.
Good evening. I'm Ellie Hasama, the Dean of the Faculty of Music since 2021. <laughs> Shortly after I moved to Toronto with my family two summers ago, I received many kind notes of congratulations and well wishes. 
none was more welcome than the one I received from John, who wrote simply, I am a former holder of this position from the 1970s. <laughs> he went on to tell me about his paper, Music at Toronto, which contained a sketch of the faculty's origins and history and some personal recollections. He arranged to have the published version sent to me. That book was a great and helpful introduction to the faculty, perhaps more so than any conversation I had in my first few months at the U of T. John's legacy at the Faculty of Music, the University, Canada, and indeed the world is extraordinary. Shortly after his passing, the office of the president lowered the university's flag to half-mast in his honor. As I told John, I knew of him and his work for many years as an undergraduate student in the United States. Walking into this cavernous building in the summer of 2021, emptied out by the pandemic, I was met every day by the score of his wonderful composition, A Game of Bowls, which was featured in an exhibition devoted to music notation throughout history and organized by the music library. I have enjoyed getting to know more about John's life and work through his voluminous writings including his memoir in which he mentions um, the composer Norma Beecroft, an early interest in Spike Jones, and many luminaries, um, some of whom are here with us today. The last time I saw John was at the Canadian Music Center celebration last September of his 17th book, Music Annals, superbly edited by Robin Elliott. The celebration included performances of two of his recent works from 2018, Meanwhile for Percussion and Piano and Chapters and Verses for two equal sopranos and viola. This evening we're treated to a delightful array of compositions, many of which beautifully showcase John's keen ear for the relationship between text and music, word and sound. I so wish I had been able to spend more time with John, but I have treasured the opportunity to get him to know his family during my still brief time in Toronto. He has made a lasting imprint on this faculty, and we will remember John Beckwith always with great admiration and affection. Thank you.
the hopeful is supposed to be cruel. You were raised among the society of friends. Sharing 
Soldiers, why should we be melancholy, boys? Why, soldiers, why? Whose business is to
Kathleen and Larry for giving me this opportunity to speak about John Becker. Last week I attended in Montreal a concert in which I had to sit through an exceedingly noisy and lengthy percussion concerto. As the piece went on and on, I found my attention wandering. At the time, I was much preoccupied with what I would say about John this evening, and I began wondering what he would have said about this exuberant and vacuous display of virtuosity. <laughs> if, he, if he had written a review of the concert, would he have described it as hokum, as he once described a piece of Alexander Brock? Or would he have used such phrases as noise pollution, or perhaps have gently poked a few holes in the pretentiousness of the piece, as he could do so amusingly and effectively, even with someone of the stature of Murray Schaefer? Or would he have fired off one of his inimitable letters of protest to the person responsible for programming that work, the conductor, the dean of the faculty, um, the editor of the local newspaper? How to speak about nearly a whole lifetime's acquaintance with John Beckwith in a few words? Impossible. Such a unique, versatile, enormously gifted and accomplished person who had an enormous impact on so many aspects of musical life in Canada for more than 70 years. A person who achieved in one lifetime what most people would probably have needed four or five lifetimes to achieve. And he was, without doubt, one of the most important people in my life. I first met John in the fall of 1960. I had just turned 18 and was beginning university. He had been assigned to teach a kind of musicianship class to a small group of little would-be pianists, 
who had received scholarships from the Royal Conservatory. I was one of these. In class one day, John showed us a passage from the last movement of Bartok's fifth string quartet, in which there is an example of bitonality. And I won't spoil your evening by trying to sing it for you. <laughs> um, it's there. This piqued my interest. I knew a few works of Bartok, but not the string quartets. I went out and purchased recordings of them and was enthralled by this exotic new world of music. It was one of the most important musical revelations of my life. At the time, I was writing some pieces for string quartet, and as a result of my encounter with the Bartok quartets, the second and third of my pieces looked and sounded much like Bartok. <laughs> but no matter, they were still much better than the terribly incoherent first piece written before the discovery of the Bartok quartets, and I owed that discovery to John. In the early 1960s, in addition to his full-time work teaching in the Faculty of Music, and you know he was never uh, doing less than three or four jobs at the same time, he was also a music critic for the Toronto Star, and over the course of a few years, reviewed several concerts of student compositions by pupils of Sam Dolan, of whom I was one. John was very positive and encouraging me, to me in those reviews. There were undoubtedly many flaws in these early efforts of mine, but he must have detected some kind of promise. I will always be grateful to him for that. Encouragement for young would-be composers was in short supply in those years. My compositional activities, however, finally derailed my progress as a would-be pianist, and I transferred to the Bachelor of Music program in the Faculty of Music. Over several years, and this is in the early 60s, I took four, four full-year courses with John, first-year harmony, pre-19th century history, Baroque counterpoint, and fugue. I can truthfully say that he was one of the very few people in those years at the Faculty of Music who actually knew how to teach. His classes were well-organized, material clearly presented, and above all, not only did he have us listen to music, but played many of the examples himself on the piano. He was, as everyone knows, a remarkably fine pianist. And I can remember in a counterpoint class when we were looking at canons, he talked about the canons and the golden variations, and he sat down at the piano and played them. And of course, you may know that he was uh, the one who gave, I think, the first public performance of the golden variations as a lecture recital in 1950 as a very young man. Um, I think that performing and listening to music was an essential part of his musical personality, and this was probably closely related to his need to create music himself. His manner of teaching was not coercive, but rather relaxed and encouraging. This is something interesting you should know about. He made you curious. No sledgehammer approach. No fleeing from the classroom in tears fair and even-handed in dealing with students. And of course, you realized that this man was enormously knowledgeable. Not surprising, considering all those years at the CBC as a continuity writer and broadcaster. When I began teaching at McGill many years later, I tried to model my teaching after what I remembered of his. Taking a course in fugue with John also helped me in an unexpected way. When I applied to McGill University in the early 1970s, for a one-year replacement position for the legendary Kelsey Jones, who taught fugue, among other things, I asked John to write a recommendation for me, hoping that I had done well enough in that long-ago fugue course to be able to stand in for Kelsey. He did so, and must have written positively about my fugue teaching potential, <laughs> since I not only got the job, but was able to stay on and teach fugue whenever Kelsey was on sabbatical. Of course, I managed to teach a few other things as well. In the early 1970s, when John was head of the Canadian Music Centre Publications Committee, he was probably the one who recommended me to write one of a series of projected monographs on Canadian composers. Mine, on Harry Summers, was the first to be published, and John was my editor, working closely with me to make sure that my writing was succinct and accurate, a valuable lesson for me. In subsequent years, I channeled much of my energy into the study of teaching of Canadian music, in good part thanks to John's example. A few years after John, after John Weinsfeig had passed away, the two of us co-edited a new book on Weinsfeig 
a person we both admired. And as you can imagine, working with John on such a project was a wonderfully satisfying experience for me. His writing facility never failed to amaze me. In the time it took me to write a single chapter, he could turn out two beautifully written chapters on separate, separate topics, as well as a good part of the introduction. I have so many memories of John over the years, and these are very precious, even more so now. I remember encountering him coming out of Massey Hall one evening in the late 1960s after a TSO performance of Ives' Fourth Symphony. He seemed like a man transfixed, so moved was he by the performance of this work. I believe that Ives was one of his favorite composers, not surprising, considering that he himself had, in so many of his own pieces, tried to convey, in a kind of Ivesian manner, a sense of Canadian place, identity, or whatever you want to call it. It is sometimes said that nobody is irreplaceable, but I think someone like John Beckwith is irreplaceable. After his death, Robin Elliott remarked to me that he had been with us for so long that we all thought that he was immortal. True, but so much of what he accomplished does give him a kind of special immortality. All that music, the numerous books and articles, what he taught people like me, his generous support and friendship, his sense of humor, his unwillingness to simply accept things he didn't agree with, and so on. What a rich legacy. How fortunate we all were to have had such a person in our midst for so long. follow almost all the way through everything that went on, including the Bartok, including the, all the counterpoint studies with him, uh, all those aspects, and always that fabulous sense of humor, and the mind and the memory, which was so far beyond us, that uh, often in front of the class, he would be laughing and laughing and laughing <laughs> at his own jokes, <laughs> and we just get it. <laughs> we weren't smart enough, we hadn't acquired enough knowledge yet to understand the jokes. <laughs> so, no, there's no doubt he's a, one of the most outstanding people in our, in our memories, and he gave us so very, very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be able to play this piece. That's the last, one of his last pieces that he, he composed. And Bill Aid and I, he wrote it for Bill and Aid. Bill Aid and I for a concert at the Arts and Letters Club, which is only a few years ago, I think 2014 was that performance. Before that, I played oh, probably half a dozen pieces or more from, from John. And I'm very happy that Chris is playing with me now. And uh, you will hear all his wit is in this piece.
Good evening. My name is Robin Elliott, and I hold the Jean A. Chalmers Chair in Canadian Music here at the University of Toronto, a position that was created for John Beckwith in 1984, and which he held for seven years until his retirement. John was a wonderful mentor over the course of the 43 years that I knew him, and a much-loved friend to me, my wife Valerie, and our three daughters. Collaborating with him on many projects over the years, including his final book, Music Annals, will always be among the most treasured memories of my career. It is fitting that tonight's event began with calling, as music was indeed a calling for John, rather than a job or a pastime. It was a calling to which he devoted all of his immense talents, boundless energy, and fertile imagination. When he was asked during an interview on the occasion of his 90th birthday, whether he ever thought that he would end up in a field other than music, his cogent reply was, you must be kidding. <laughs> his long association with the U of T Faculty of Music began in 1945 when he entered the BMUS program here. His last official role came 72 years later when he served as the Wilma and Clifford Smith Visitor in Music in 2017 at age 90. 
John had considerable theater experience in his youth, and this background, combined with his musicality, was evident in his speaking voice. He would underline important words with dramatic pauses, and he was a virtuoso at using vocal pitch inflection, speech rhythms, and dynamic emphasis in creative ways. This talent was put to good use during his years as a CBC presenter. I'm so glad that the superb exhibit that our music archivist Rebecca Shaw has prepared about John includes a generous sampling of his CBC radio shows and interviews, and I encourage you to listen to them on the tablet in the lobby outside of the music library. Education was central to John's mission in life both in his capacity as a professor here at the university and in his work as a public intellectual. He contributed to the musical life of Canada tires tirelessly as a composer, scholar, writer, pianist, administrator, animateur, editor, music critic, panelist, broadcaster, lecturer, peer reviewer, organizer, arranger, adjudicator, spokesperson, provocateur, supporter, and faithful audience member at countless concerts. Nevertheless, John's primary identity was as a composer. His autobiography, Unheard Of, is subtitled Memoirs of a Canadian Composer, and his personal website is unambiguously and proudly titled John Beckwith, Composer. He was a prolific creator with over 160 compositions in all manner of genres. Nothing about his creative work was routine. Each new creative project presented a unique set of circumstances and challenges. He typically wrote with particular musicians in mind, would begin with carefully considered and well thought out pre-compositional ideas, and then let the creative process take him where it may. In his work as a scholar of Canadian music, John always kept the music itself front and centre. As a result, his scholarship remains as fresh and relevant now as it was over 65 years ago, when he began to write seriously about music. He had a talent for explaining complicated matters in a clear and cogent way, and avoiding professional jargon so that the average reader without specialist knowledge can understand his main points. He demonstrated eloquently why the music that he wrote about was important to him, and why we in turn should care about it. His body of scholarly work is and will remain essential reading for everyone who cares about the music of Canada. The, mo the works that we are hearing this evening reflect many of John's interests. Canadian music, literature and history, contemporary poetry, both Canadian and international, chamber music, song, choral music and opera. It is a rich tapestry woven from varied strands of the Canadian experience and stamped throughout with John's personal style which is by turns lively and introspective, demanding and accessible, witty and serious. As a scholar, composer, and in all those many other capacities about which I did not have time to elaborate, John's contributions to Canadian music were decisive, imaginative, comprehensive, transformative. What John valued above all else was live music making. So I'm very happy to cede the stage now to David Fallis and Choir 21 for a, for a performance of The Sharon Fragments.
thank you for participating tonight. As performance, performers and audience, we have all played our parts in creating a powerful musical experience. Larry's family and I have received cards and messages of sympathy from hundreds of people, many noting John's strong influence or huge presence in their lives, his kindness, generosity, and brilliance. Robin Elliott published eloquent appreciations in the Globe and Mail and in the newsletter of his Institute for Music in Canada. Thank you for these expressions of support. We have needed them. John was a wonderful person in his every role as a fellow musician, composer, performer, an academic colleague, a teacher, writer and editor, as a speaker to community organizations, or as another presence in the bike lane or in a <laughs> Scottish country dance. To me, his clarity of vision was predominant and astonishing. I think he saw the world in all its colors and shades, undistorted, without fear, without overgeneralizing or labeling, always with a positive response. Within his family, of course, his encouragement and support of our efforts was boundless. He spent his professional life as an advocate for creative Canadian music and musicians, exhorting his fellow citizens to understand that Harry Summers is as significant a figure in our cultural history as A.Y. Jackson or Margaret Lawrence, and by contributing his own compositions to that story. He has been described as having strong opinions forcefully expressed. I've been spending some time recently with his essay collections, music papers, and music annals, and other writings, I think they show attention to facts and exhibit warmth and humor as much as criticism. He would mock foolish actions or ideas, but he didn't call anybody a fool. The last piece we will hear is John's arrangement of the ultimate tearjerker poem by Robert Burns. <laughs> A fond kiss, and then we sever. A farewell, alas, forever. The program invites you to a reception in the Walter Hall lobby, but it will take place indeed in the main lobby upstairs. Please join us there. <laughs> 